Great to be here today. As uh, Kay said, we had a wonderful time last night with Bayside Carols and uh, a big thank you to everyone who was part of that. And uh, you will enjoy, I'm sure, uh, watching the live stream on Christmas morning. It'll be a lovely part of your Christmas uh, celebrations. I want to bring the scriptures to you today. If you want to follow this message in your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. And you'll find message notes and discussion questions on the Bayside Church website and app. You just uh, click on Connect with God and Messages and it will bring up uh, the message of the day. For those of you uh, who are watching on live stream, a warm welcome to you and I hope you enjoy the teaching of the Scriptures today. I want to continue um, from a series I commenced earlier in the year and I'm just going to add to this series every now and again. It's called the Bible Series. And uh, the title of the message today is Jesus at the Centre. If you've missed any of these messages, they're all on the Bayside Church website. As we discovered earlier this year, uh, the Scriptures submit to Jesus that the written Word submits to the living Word. We saw that the Scriptures, the Bible, is actually the small w Word of God, and then in John chapter 1, particularly, Jesus is uh, recognized as the capital W or the big W, uh, Word of God, not the department store, right? The Savior, the Son of God, just a little bit more important than big W. Uh, the Reverend Peter Bartell puts it this way, read the Bible when anything in the rest of the Bible disagrees with Jesus, listen to Jesus. I think that's really wise advice and something that helps us to understand the scriptures and to put them into context. That's how Jesus understood and used the scriptures and he sets the pattern that will help us too with the Bible. And so when we come to the Bible, sometimes people are a little bit confused, you know, because some things in the Bible make a lot of sense and then there's other things that we look at and we go, what's with that? Why is that in there? And so it's important that we have the right lenses on when we are reading the Scriptures and studying the Bible. Talking about lenses, right? I noticed that Andrew takes his glasses off to read. Anyone else notice that as well? I'm thinking, no, you all look lovely and clear to me until I put my glasses on, but I can read with my glasses. And I've had these now since my mid-40s, and I realized after a while that my arms just weren't long enough anymore. Because I'd be reading something and gradually the page would just have to get further and further away until I couldn't stretch any longer. And eventually I relented because I had 20-20 vision uh, in my younger years and I was very proud of my vision. And I didn't want to admit that my vision wasn't as great as it used to be and that I needed glasses. So I went along to an optrician, I had a, an eye test and they confirmed my greatest fears that I needed glasses. Of course, when you get glasses, that's one thing, but because you're not in the habit of having them with you. And so I used to forget my glasses all the time. As we'd be at a cafe or a restaurant or somewhere where I needed to read something and I wouldn't have my glasses with me. And I'd say to Christy, can you read the menu for me? And so eventually I got into the habit uh, of taking them with me everywhere I went. And there, I have had the experience on occasion where I've dropped the glasses and one of the lenses has fallen out. And they're not always that easy to press back in again. And so you put your glasses on, but now you've only got one lens. And so everything's just kind of a little bit strange. It's like covering one eye. Everything looks a bit two-dimensional, a bit strange. But it's wonderful when you've got both lenses in and I can see clearly now, as the old song goes, having both lenses in. And so particularly when it comes to what uh, our Hebrew friends called the Tanakh, which I think is a, a much nicer frame than the Old Testament. I think if we take everything that Jewish people uh, who are believers in God hold precious and then call it old. <laughs> and so I love the Tanakh or the, the Hebrew Scriptures. When we're reading those as Christians, it's important that we've got both lenses in. We need the lens of the New Testament and the lens of Jesus, and then we read the Scriptures accordingly. John Wesley, the great revivalist, put it this way, 
as the full and final revelation of God, Jesus is the criterion for evaluating Scripture, the prism through which the Hebrew Scriptures must be read. All of Scripture must be read through Jesus. And so we have Jesus at the center of the Scriptures, and then we read back and we read forward through the lens of Jesus. Now, a few weeks ago, I shared around the offering um, about how Jesus dealt with the Scriptures. And that when he came to understand the Scriptures of his day were the Tanakh, they were what we call the Old Testament. That was the sum total. The actual Bible that we have in our hands now wasn't finally compiled until the fourth century. And so when we come to Jesus, what he does with the Scriptures is he changes some of them. Some of them, he just says, that doesn't apply any longer. Uh, Andrew used a great example uh, in the offering today uh, of Cornelius, uh, because Peter, as a Jewish man, would have been under Jewish law, and so there were certain foods that were unclean to him. They would never have been through his lips before. And so seeing this vision of all of these unclean animals being let down in a sheet from heaven and a voice saying, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And that happening three times. That would have been horrendous to Peter. Uh, Side message here, though, Peter was also staying with a guy called Simon the Tanner, someone who dealt with dead animal skins. And so a tanner under Jewish law would have been continually unclean. And so Peter was actually being somewhat hypocritical here. I'm living in the house of an unclean person, but (gasps) shock, horror. God, you want me to eat what? I wouldn't do that. And what God shows him through that vision is that the laws, the uh, food laws under the Hebrew Scriptures are no longer applicable today. But what a wonderful message that is in Acts chapter 10, uh, where, where the angel says or the voice says over and over again, Uh, What I have called clean no longer refer refer to as unclean. That's a message the church of 2023 needs to hear again and again and again because even to this day, we have certain people in society where we hold at arm's length, but the Bible says, no, 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 I've cleansed them. Everyone's been cleansed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so some of the things in the Hebrew Scriptures have been changed, some of them ceased, and some of them continued. And I want to just kind of unpack those three things with you for a few minutes today. So first of all, let's see what Jesus changed in the Scriptures. What changed? Theologian C.S. Cowles wrote this. While Jesus affirmed the Hebrew Scriptures as the authentic Word of God, He did not endorse every word in them as God's. And then the theologian gives some examples. He rejected the Torah texts as representing the original intention and will of God, such as Moses' divorce laws. He displaced Moses' laws governing vengeance with a new ethic of active non-violent resistance, of overcoming evil with good. His command to love your enemies represents a total repudiation of Moses' genocidal commands and stands in judgment on Joshua's campaign of ethnic cleansing. I love that statement. If you're anything like me, you read through some of those stories in the Hebrew Scriptures where it seems that God commands the complete annihilation of entire people groups. And you look at that, you read that with with a sense of horror And Jesus comes along and goes, "Um, that wasn't God. (laughs) Jesus has a brand new ethic. And so that brings us to our text today, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38, where Jesus says this, you've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Now, in your own time, have a read through Matthew chapter 5 and note the number of times that Jesus says, you've heard that it was said. And what he does then is he quotes something from the Hebrew Scriptures and and then he changes it. He transforms it. Uh, Sometimes he makes it tougher. Sometimes he just changes it and and makes it more kind, uh, more gracious. You've heard that it was said and then he quotes 
from Exodus and Deuteronomy, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Basically, vengeance. Jesus quotes from Exodus 21, uh, verses 23 to 25. Let me read that to you. If there is a serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. That's pretty concerning stuff, isn't it? Now, this was legal retribution in the ancient world. This is 3,000 to 4,000 years ago, really prehistoric times uh, in, in time scale. Legal retribution enforced by a court. This wasn't personal vengeance, but it's still pretty full on. You know, if someone has done something that's caused you to be wounded in some way, the court could legislate for the person who caused that harm to be harmed in exactly the same way. If they caused you to be burnt, they could be taken out and burnt. If they caused you to lose an eye, then the court could legislate for you to lose an eye and so on. Stuff that we would find completely horrendous, or at least we should today. He's also quoting from Deuteronomy 19 verse 21. The author adds, show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Notice those words, show no pity. What was Jesus' take on this? Well, look at how he changed the scriptures. Matthew 5 and verse 39, because he said, you've heard that it was said, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow you. Do not resist an evil person. The word resist in the Greek is a military term. It means to take a strong stand against an opponent. And Jesus says, do not take a strong stand against an opponent. The Hebrew scriptures advocate for retaliation without pity. Jesus changes this to non-passive peacemaking. And I want to emphasize there's not passive peacemaking that Jesus is talking about here. It is non-passive, as evidenced by his statement, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. What does that mean? I've always heard it kind of taught that, well, if someone hits you on one side of the head, turn around and let them hit, hit you on the other. Basically, be a doormat for Jesus and let people walk all over you. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. And this is really, really important. First century society was governed by military law and the Roman class system. In the Roman class system, there were nine classes. Galilean peasants, by the way, were a class eight. So there was a class, one class below most of the people who were listening to Jesus. No, it's not my phone. No, it's somebody's phone. It's God telling you to turn your phone off. <laughs> so there were eight classes. So there's one class lower. The shepherds, by the way, that were the first to get the message to go and visit the Messiah, they would have been in class nine. Right on the very bottom rung, below Galilee and peasants, because they were constantly unclean because of what they did, according to Jewish law. Isn't that wonderful? And then you get the people at the top of the rung, in, in class one, the Magi, the, the wise men, uh, the Gentiles from, from Arabia. And so just in the Christmas story alone, we see God say, I want the people at the lowest and the people at the highest and everybody in between involved in the redemption story. So anyway, back to um, the right cheek. If we were equals and we had a confrontation, I would slap you with my right hand. So if I connected my right hand, um, it would hit you on the left cheek, okay? Um, 
If you were from a lower class than me, I would slap you with my left hand. Now, the left hand in the first century was called the dirty hand. It was the poo hand. It was literally in the first century, they would wipe their bottoms and do anything unpleasant or unclean with the left hand. That's why we always shake with the right hand, right? Now, I'm not going to ask anybody what hand you use. It doesn't matter today. We have soap and water. Please use them. When you go to the restroom, sometimes I've been into the restroom and someone's gone to the loo and then they just walk out. And I'm like, okay, note to self, do not shake that person's hand <laughs> after church today. Hi, lovely to see you. <laughs> and then you get home and you have to wash the fellowship off your hands, right? <laughs> Please wash your hands. But they didn't necessarily have that in the first century. And so it was a well-known thing that the left hand was the dirty hand, the poo hand, and the right hand was, um, was the clean hand. And so what Jesus is saying here is anyone slaps you on the right cheek, to slap someone on the right cheek, you have to use your left hand. Well, that's what it's saying here. Someone would do that as, as a... Uh, as a statement that you are inferior to them. And so what Jesus says is this, turn your other cheek. In other words, if they're going to hit you, force them to hit you as an equal. That's pretty stunning. See, that's not passive peacemaking. And so back to Jesus' statement, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, for someone to do this, as I say, they would have to hit you. On the left hand, I've said all of that, haven't I? And so what Jesus is teaching here is don't escalate a situation, but present the side of you that makes them strike you as an equal, which they won't do. Because to do that would force them to admit that you are a peer and not a peasant. And so it's important that we understand that peacemaking is not passive. Jesus is not teaching us to be doormats who let people walk over us. On the contrary, Jesus teaches us not to simply take what anyone is dishing out, but he also teaches his followers not to escalate a situation either. Amazing wisdom, great wisdom. So now let's look at the next few verses in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard that it was said, Old Testament times, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus changes this. He says, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So to summarize those verses, the sun rises on evil people, the rain falls on the unrighteous, the Lord is good to all, says the psalmist. You be good to everyone, says Jesus, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Even the tax collectors love those who love them, even the pagans greet others with a joyous welcome. You do that too, declares Jesus, even to people you don't like. Jesus calls his people to a higher way of doing and being more than what people expect of them. In so doing, our Christ-like character grows in maturity. And so some things in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, were changed by Jesus. Secondly, what ceased? It's an amazing story, um, in Matthew chapter 17, of the transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus was transfigured. He was changed, transformed in front of them. There was a sense of uh, Jesus, of course, in human form, being God, 100% God, uh, but also 100% deity. But it was almost as if his um, humanity couldn't contain the deity that was in him. It was like the deity wanted to spring out. And so this incredible transformation. The Greek word there, by the way, for transfigured or transformed is metamorpho. 
Isn't that interesting? So metamorphosis, think about the transformation that a caterpillar goes through to become a beautiful butterfly. It's the same word as used in 2 Corinthians 3, where it says, and we will be changed from one degree of glory to the next as the Holy Spirit does His work. We all go through that transfiguration, that metamorphosis um, uh, process as well. And so Jesus is being transfigured. And the Scriptures tell us that Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus. And so they're having this conversation. One of the Gospels says that Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about what He's about to do in Jerusalem. And from there on, Jesus talks a lot about his uh, impending torture and crucifixion, about his death and about his resurrection with the disciples. And it's fascinating because Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets are a way of, of saying the entire Tanakh. All of the Hebrew scriptures are wrapped up in, in that. And so everything Moses wrote, everything that Elijah or the prophets wrote is basically the whole of what we call the Old Testament. And it's those scriptures that foretold the coming of the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies uttered by the, Moses and Elijah, uh, Moses and, and, um, and, and all of the prophets foretold Jesus. And so here they are standing on a mountain with Jesus having a conversation um, as representing the entire Bible on the first century. And, and Peter, James, and John are, are with Jesus. And Peter, of course, at this point, had still not learned not to say anything. Dear Peter, sometimes he, he got everything right, other times he got everything wrong, and invariably he spoke because he just wasn't sure what else to do. I love Peter, don't you? He's beautiful. So he's standing there and goes, I haven't got a clue what to say. This is amazing. So I'm going to say something. And what he says is, Jesus, how about I build three tents? One for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. What was he saying? I, I, I want to, this is an amazing experience. Let's stay here. There's another sermon right there, isn't there? You know, when we have experiences as Christians, sometimes we just want to camp in that experience. And I understand why, but God is constantly moving forward. There are, there are entire churches, there are entire Christian organizations that were built around an historical experience, but they haven't stayed fresh. We want to stay fresh as a church. We praise God for what He's done over the last 31 and a half years. But, the, you know, there's still wonderful things happening and there's still wonderful things for us to embrace in the future uh, as a church community. And so Peter wants to build three tents. And right at that moment, God shows up and shuts Peter up. Read these, look, just look at these verses. Matthew 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, while Peter was still going, oh, I haven't got a clue what I'm talking about here, but, you know, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased, listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell down, uh, face down on the ground, to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Wow. Some things had ceased right there. It was like Moses and Elijah had come and then just passed the baton to Jesus. Because they had, along with lots of other people in Old Testament times, written so many things looking forward to the time the Messiah would come. And they appeared with him on the mountain, passed the baton over. Jesus, you have fulfilled everything that's been written about you. Jesus even said that. He said, I haven't come to do away with the Scriptures. He said, I've come to fulfill and so when the disciples open their eyes, they look up and, and Moses and Elijah have ceased and Jesus is there. Magnificent story. Jesus fulfilled everything spoken by Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. In fact, the Bible itself says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. 
And so a whole lot of things ceased that we don't have time to go through today, but in your message notes, I've put lots of scripture references, and you might like to find some time during the week to look up some of these and to read and reflect on them. But Sabbath worship has ceased. We don't need to gather on a particular day anymore. Some people do, and the Bible says if you hold one day as special, then that's fine for you. Other people, like myself, view every day as a holy day to the Lord, where I am living for Jesus every day. What about you? Living for Him every day, so every day is special. So Sabbath worship ceased with Jesus. Circumcision ceased with Jesus. And all the uncircumcised guys said nothing at all because they didn't want to give it away. Animal sacrifices ceased. Glad about that. Food laws have ceased, as we reflected earlier uh, with the story of, of Cornelius. In fact, Mark in his gospel tells us that Jesus declared all foods clean. And so all of those things ceased. If you want to go out for lunch today and have seafood or pork or bacon, just knock yourself out. You go for it. Finally, just to wrap this up, what continued? Well, pretty much everything else. God's love for all people on this planet continues. Worship continues. The Psalms, often Jesus and the disciples would, would gather and sing praises together. Pretty amazing. Worship. Tithing continues from old to new. And of course, all the commandments. It's still wrong to murder and to lie, to commit adultery. But all of the commandments are tied to the law of love. Paul wrote about that in Romans 13. The commandments, you shall not kill, uh, sorry, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. What other, uh, other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so the 613 laws in, in the Hebrew Scriptures you don't have to remember them all. You don't even have to know them all. All you have to do is live a life of love. Because if, if, if I love, uh, that I'm living by love, then I'm, I'm not going to commit adultery. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I love you, I'm not going to kill you. Right? If I don't love you, I'm not going to kill you either. I just want to <laughs> hasten to add there. If I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. Uh, so we live a life of love. And then, of course, our responsibility is God's people to help the poor and, to, and the marginalized. It's got to be, actually, probably the biggest theme in Scripture. Oh, there are over 2,000 references in the entire Bible to the responsibility of God's people caring for those who are struggling in life. It's a major theme. And so because of it's a major theme in Scripture, it's a major theme in our church as well. And uh, I'm just going to share some things with you just very quickly as I wrap this up for the next couple of minutes. But we've had a, we've had a, a wonderful week this week um, on, with Bayside Community Care and, and helping a lot of people. And so you heard on Bayside News about Matt's Place. And this is something we've been doing now for, I think, about 12, about 12 years. Um, every Tuesday and every Thursday at lunchtime, we partner with two Anglican churches, St. Matthew's Church here in um, Cheltenham and also St. Chad's in Chelsea and a number of other churches contribute in various ways as well, as well as community groups are involved. This came, by the way, out of a conversation that I had with several other pastors well over a decade ago. We were meeting together to talk and to pray about how we collectively as churches in the Bayside area could really make a difference to, to people in the community. And so out of that prayer time, we decided that we'd go and meet with the mayor of the city and sit and, and talk with her. And so we had a, a meeting with her and with the CEO of the city. And we said, we would like to do something to serve the city. What could we do? What would you like done that isn't being done at the moment? And the mayor said very quickly, she said, Look, there's an increasing number of homeless and disenfranchised people in the Bayside area, and so she said, if you could feed them once a week, that would be wonderful. And we said, we can do that, and we did, and we do. We've been doing it ever since. Every year we give out thousands 
of hot meals. So every Tuesday lunchtime, every Thursday lunchtime, a hot two-course lunch for people who are homeless, lonely, just struggling in life. They meet together, there's community there, lots of other services gather around them, haircuts and clothing and the shower bus and all sorts of things in caring for them. And last Thursday, George Columbaris came along, you know, the Master Chef, ex Master Chef judge. So we've got a photo there. There's George with Sandra, who heads up Bayside Community Care and a couple of our volunteers as well. If you go onto the Bayside Church Facebook page, uh, you'll find a video that was filmed by Bayside Media uh, with George. And he was so impressed with Matt's place. He just loves it. And uh, next year, he's going to bring his team and they're going to cook for the Matt's Place guests. Yeah, absolutely. Put your hands together. Isn't that great? Now, this next photo, they look very elongated. Sorry, it was off my phone. Obviously, I didn't take it right. But uh, they are the helpers who came on Thursday morning to wrap 127 presents. So every year, we partner with Prison Fellowship to provide gifts for the children uh, who have at least one parent in prison. And so invariably those uh, parents can't provide the gifts for the kids. And so groups like Bayside, uh, partnering with Beaumaris Rotary Club and lots of other organisations around Australia uh, get together. So many of you have contributed gifts this year and this team came along and wrapped them all on Thursday morning and then they were all taken to the post, post office and posted to the various children uh, all around Victoria and Melbourne. Isn't that stunning? So that's something else we've done. And then also on Thursday morning, another team came in and packed 250 Christmas hampers. In and out. That's very impressive, Cheryl. Isn't that great? Beautiful. So they're going to be distributed to people in need, some of those folk in our own church community. Um, many of them, of course, not part of our church community, but people that we know about. Uh, in, the, in the local area. Many of them come in regularly for hampers during the year. Uh, and we've seen a, 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 a big increase in the demand, as have many churches and charities for these sorts of things, because things are tight right now, as I'm sure you're aware, in society. And so we just wanted to make sure that we, we help. And so not just those who came and packed, but many of you brought items in for those hampers over the last few weeks and thank you so much. And so um, our responsibility as God's people to help the poor and the marginalised um, is a big part of what we do uh, as a church because that was continued by Jesus from Old Testament through to New. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word today. And I thank you, Lord, for this amazing church community who are so willing, Lord, at giving their time and their finance and bringing in food for hampers and volunteering in lots of different ways. And I pray, Father, for your blessing upon each person. I just want to thank you for our amazing church community, just incredible people that love you, that love one another and love to make a difference in this world. We give you all the praise, Lord God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you changed some stuff. The other stuff just stopped. But lots of wonderful things continue. And help us continue to love you, to walk with you and with one another, and to serve each other, to serve you and the broader community. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, just before I hand back to Kay, there are some uh, turquoise bags on the right-hand side as you exit today. And if you are new at Bayside, you've been maybe first time today or coming along the last few weeks, and you're just kind of on the edge, checking things out. Who is this Jesus guy? What is this Christianity all about? And so on. I invite you to take one of those turquoise bags with you today. You'll find a Bible in there. That's our gift to you. There's some information in there that will help you get started on your Christian journey. And we also run a course here, which we will start again in the new year, called the Alpha Course, that is done by millions of people all around the world. And it's a great course, a short course, that introduces you to Jesus and the Christian faith. So if you like, you can just fill out a form there or register 
on the Bayside Church website and uh, we'll get in touch with you in the new year. God bless you, church.